from Microbe TV. This is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 178, recorded on December 3rd, 2019. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today, remotely, Dixon de Pommier. Hello there, Vincent. And Daniel Griffin. Hello, everybody. Hello there, Vin. Hello there, Daniel. <laughs> I, I didn't. I didn't know Dixon was remote. Yeah, there. Everybody's well, remote except me. I'm local. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm here in my office. I'm running the boards. Yeah, now, now it makes sense when Dixon was going to run out to his car and get the books. Why you wouldn't be there? <laughs> right. The book, uh, um, e- edition number seven. That's yes. Right. If you like what we do here on TWIP and all the other podcasts of Microbe TV, consider supporting us financially, microbe.tv slash contribute. Also would like to announce some interesting develop- developments over at Parasites Without Borders. Parasites Without Borders now has a Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter account. Yes, we do. <laughs> we got Facebook.com slash Parasites Without Borders. We have Instagram.com slash PWB underscore worldwide. Wow. Twitter.com slash PWB underscore global. And there you can see pictures of Daniel in Africa. Yes, yes. And riding a motorcycle. Uh, you know, <laughs> right before the uh, before the show started, Dixon started to ask, you know, oh, you know, were your travels, you know, did they go well? Did you, you, you caught your flight? And um, I, I just very shortly said no. <laughs> what happened <laughs> was it, it, it takes so long for me to get to these places that when I'm there, I, I really want to be working, not not traveling. So there was a whole whole discussion as we got near the end of the second week, because um, when I'm there, I try to I try to basically see patients, teach, um, you know, do, do stuff five or six days a week. And here it was as the last week was ending. And it was, you know, boy, do you think it's going to be safe to just get up super early Saturday and travel all the way from eastern Uganda? across to Entebbe, um, uh, you know, by the DRC, or would it make more sense to leave a little bit early on Friday? And, you know, I, of course, was like, you know, I want to get as much work in as possible. I'll wait till uh, Saturday morning. And right. that Friday was the worst rains, perhaps, in the history oh, of Uganda. No. And the, there was no way that a four-wheel vehicle, a car or a truck or anything could make it up into the mountains where the clinic was. So six o'clock, seven o'clock, you know, the hours are going by and I'm like, what am I going to do? Finally, um, at one point I, um, I was like, we got to do something. So we put my suitcases on the back of one motorcycle. I got on the back of another motorcycle and we descended down to where, um, larger vehicle could travel through the flooded roads, um, on the motorcycles. (laughs) <laughs> until finally I got where a car could come. And mm. yeah, by, by this, this point I had missed my flight and, you know, ended up having to take a later flight, but, uh, but I did make it back in one piece. So how long did you have to wait at the airport? Um, I ended up making it, uh, to the airport and probably waiting about six or seven hours before I could catch a flight. What did you do? I just sort of sat there. <laughs> I read, <laughs> I've always, I've always got, I've always got work to do. Practice your Swahili. <laughs> well, you could plug in your laptop, right? I listened to some podcasts. I must admit, I had a few podcasts. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, but it was. Uh, but I have to say, it was a great. It was a great um, trip to Uganda this time. Did you see a lot of interesting cases. I did, and um, you know, there's a few that I'll share. And um, I guess, I guess sure. while we're talking, I just give some background to you know our listeners who may not know what the story was. I um, periodically do um, these trips where I go overseas uh, to do volunteer work to take care of patients and also to do a bit of uh, teaching, mentoring. And I was returning to the the FIMRIC, Foundation International Medical Relief of Children site in eastern Uganda in Baduda, which is a pretty pretty rural area up in the mountains, spectacular um, place. Mm. Um, 
And this is an organization I've worked with before, a clinic I'm returning to. And um, it is uh, pretty much staffed by local Ugandan um, providers. Um, and there are a few um, FIMRC volunteers, management people that are involved. So there was, uh, there was Nick, who was the, the new manager, replacing my good friend Brian. And there were two um, two women in their 20s who were one Kaylee was or is a nurse and uh, Grace is the glo- she just finished her work in uh, global health and she's doing uh, this in- intern stint down there um, but it was it was great to see everyone again and uh, wow. I guess they're very grateful for your presence right you know they they are so appreciative and thankful it is um it is great it, it's part of what makes it um so rewarding you know because it is i have to say it's it's tough work at times you know and you're not you know living under sort of you know luxurious um situation there um you know and it's tough you know you might see over 100 um mostly children mm. in a day in clinic and some of the stuff is really heartbreaking and it, it, it's tough but you know the the people that you're working with um really make it something um, doable and something rewarding. And So basically, you have to leave the U.S. to be appreciated. <laughs> no, I shouldn't say well. <laughs> No, you know, I have to, I have to say, actually. Um, you know, I think I was telling a story, um, appar- apparently too much, because when I joked with the hospital, I'm like, oh, here comes this hospitalist. He's going to have me talking for a long time. He's like, me talking? You're the one who's always telling stories. <laughs> and No, I recently had a sort of a mystery case where the woman had seen, you know, 10 different providers and finally ended up in the hospital. And apparently she was a VIP. And so, you know, I took my time. I always go slow when they're VIP. I think it's passive aggressive, but wow. no, but no, I'm joking. But though, then I went in and I got the story. And, you know, as I said, I asked her two questions, sort of cracked the case after months of it being a mystery. And, yeah. and she, she was better and very appreciative. So I, you, you get appreciated here as well. Okay. Yeah. I, I was joking, so. but you know. <laughs> I would like to add my two cents to where I was during that time too. So uh, Chuck Kinnersh, one of the authors on our book, and myself attended the uh, American Society for Tropical Medicine and Hygiene down in uh, Washington. Actually, it wasn't in Washington. It was at the uh, Gaylord Resort and Convention Center on the National, and I'm going to say National Inlet or National Bayou or National something. It was, it was in a place that I had never even heard of before, um, and the meeting was fantastic. And almost to a person that I was introduced to, they said, hey, you're, you're on TWIP, aren't you? And you, you might be on TWIP. Also. I'm not kidding. The recognition of the name, those two names, TWIP and TWIV, have permeated that society. Almost everybody knew about us. And I was great, great. absolutely knocked out. And I wanted all of you and our listeners to hear about that as well, because uh, uh, this, this series is actually working. So do you finally get it, Dixon? <laughs> do I finally get what? I, I try to avoid it. Are you kidding? <laughs> you know, if you avoid something, you, you won't get it. <laughs> Daniel, a few months after we started TWIV, and, and, you know, Dixon, to his credit, he said, yeah, I'll do it with you. A few months, he said, I'm going to India for a few months. <laughs> no, I didn't go for he a just, few months. He just said, I'm going. Do it, I went you for know, a few weeks. Too, too bad um, on, about your podcast. So he, he just didn't... Uh, see the the value or the importance so that's why i say now you get it no i i think i think that is great that you say vincent because i really you know i you know even though i'm your colleague i i have a tremendous amount of respect for what you've created with this um you know because as a as a physician it's often i'm helping one person at a time um but your um edu edutainment um empire so to speak i mean it really it, it does a tremendous amount of good so um you know even i feel good about going to uh africa and um seeing patients every day but I think you should feel great about what you've created and all the people that get a chance, including me, to listen to all these sure. podcasts. You bet. Thank you. And, and I had several people actually ask me if they could be on our TWIP show. And, nice. And one of them will be, and I can. Uh, I don't want to give it away who it is, but it's somebody who's going to make news pretty soon with uh, his work in malaria. All right. Cool. Now, before we do our case, I wanted to have uh, read a c- three uh, follow-up quick emails. Right. First from Anthony, who writes, permethrin is toxic to cats. Now, remind me, gentlemen, how did permethrin come up? 
Mm. Are you using oh, this for what? Are, you know, so there's, there's a couple of reasons. Scabies. Scabies. Uh, but you also, a lot of people use it to treat their clothes before they travel. Um, so I, I have a picture of me in, in Africa with this little kitten sitting on my pants, which are not permethrin treated. But <laughs> so uh, <laughs> a lot of times when I travel places where I'm really going to have heavy insect exposure, like sub-Saharan yeah. Africa, uh, I will take my clothes and uh, soak them okay. in, in a permethrin um, solution. And then, you know, you wash it once, but it lasts about six cycles and actually does a great job of helping um, with insect um, prevention, but okay. yeah, he's mentioning one of the risks here to cats. So Anthony continues. Perhaps some mention might be made that cat owners must keep their pets from where permethrin is applied at least until it dries, and then provides a link to an NPR article. Perhaps for those with cats, pyrethrin might serve as a substitute. Pyrethrin has very good knockdown, though it is lacking in the persistence that permethrin has. Pyrethrin is fine for cats and even can be used directly on them for parasite control. For specific applications, the label directions and the cat's veterinarian's advice do need to be followed. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Sophia writes, hello, doctors. You don't need to read this out loud, but I would like to share a thought with you. I am because I think it's a good idea. How about doing a special episode on co-infection with parasites like malaria and Ebola? A rare coincidence? I would like to know more about how the host responds to co-infection and if infection with a parasite confers an advantage at times. Would it? Don't know. Or a disadvantage to infection with a virus. I thought this is the perfect show to talk about this since we have a virologist, a parasitologist, and an infectious (laughs) disease doctor. I would appreciate a discussion and stories, not necessarily a paper. Sorry, I don't understand most of them. (laughs) (laughs) Just the thought. All the best. Yeah, is the thought about not understanding the papers or about the topic? <laughs> I, think the paper, I think the paper. I'm sorry. It makes me feel badly that we do try and explain them. I'm sorry, Sophia, but it's a good idea. We will try and collect some stories of co-infections. There, there, are, there are some out there for sure, right, Daniel? Absolutely, Dixon. You know, today today's case actually that we'll present at the end will potentially um, bring up this issue. Okay, yeah. and then Benjamin writes. Uh, Dear TWIP team, a paper was just published in PLOS Pathogens where the authors show that Trypanosoma brucei infection can prevent malaria in a mouse model. I think this would make a really cool paper for you to review on TWIP. And I put this in because of Sophia's uh, letter, right? It's a co-infection. It's a mouse model. It's not humans, but it could illustrate the potential outcomes of a co-infection. Doesn't sound like a good trade-off to me, though, if I were (laughs) a mouse. (laughs) Yeah, yeah right. Cattle, so the Bruce is going to kill you no yeah. matter what. <laughs> no, it's not a good trade. <laughs> ben Ben is at uh, the University of Adelaide. Nice. And yeah, malaria biology lab, too. That's good. All right, Daniel, what have we got for a case from last time? Uh-huh. Right. So case from TWIP 177. <clears throat> so for those of you tuning in for the first time and for those of you tuning back in, let me present or remind you of the case. This was a um, 14-year-old man who was actually sent to me uh, by his physician for an infectious disease consultation. Uh, The story we got was that back in August, he had visited Hawaii with the family. And after Hawaii, he then flies to California. There was a family event that he was attending there. So he met up with a lot of friends and family. And, and they all go out to this Pakistani restaurant, which I pointed out. He, he tells me he, he views this as important. We will see if it is. Um, and one day after going to the Pakistani restaurant, he um, reports that he started to have um, gastrointestinal issues. Didn't feel right, nausea, diarrhea, bad enough that he actually went to an urgent care center. Um, they actually, interesting enough, sent off um, some testing, including sending off a stool for ova and parasites. And on exam, uh, he gets the report back and actually he brings all his records with him. Uh, and it, it determines that they see chylomastic mesnili. They say, all right, well, we're not going to treat this. Um, and so he, he, he then goes on and he says that over this period of about a week, he loses about 15 pounds gains about five back. So now he's about 10 pounds lower than his prior set weight. He said he'd been the same weight, you know, since his 20s. Um, So it's end of October. He's feeling fine. No bloating, no diarrhea, no symptoms. um, But he goes and sees a gastroenterologist. 
um, gastroenterologist sends off more stool testing. And at this point, the stool oven parasites uh, comes back reporting um, dientamoeba fragilis and chylomastic mesonili. And the gastroenterologist, the primary, say, I'm not really sure what to do here. Uh, let's send you to Dan Griffin. So they send him to me. He's not on any meds. Uh, reports no allergies, no toxic habits, says he's an athletic athletic guy, um, reports no past medical um, issues in the family. His exam is normal. Um, we did get a little bit of this that he ate um, salads, um, didn't really restrict himself when in Hawaii or California. Um, and as mentioned, he, he feels absolutely fine. He just is curious that this stuff is in his stool and that he is now about 10 pounds lighter than he had been for the rest of his life. Hmm. All right. We had a good response, right, Dixon? We had wonderful responses. Can you take that first letter, Dixon? Sure. Andrew writes, hi, TWIP trio. I have not written into the show for a while, but I'm really hoping to get a book. Here is my guess for TWIP 177. If I, with my lack of medical degree and little travel experience, were in Dr. Griffin's shoes, I think the first thing I would do is treat the patient's defragilis with metronidazole. The first oven parasite exam showed a commensal parasite, which gives a clue that the patient was exposed to infected feces. That's a good point. That first result should have been followed up with additional stool exams for ova and parasites, but I assume since she was on vacation at an urgent care center, his care was not followed up with problems. With properly. The second thing I would do with this patient is order another full oven parasite exam, including a modified acid fast smear for cyclospora and cryptosporidium. And I might even add a microsporidium smear as well. Since this event seems like it was food or drinking waterborne, I would be suspicious of cyclospora as well as defragilis. I'm probably totally wrong, but I'm not a doctor. I work in the lab looking at these organisms at the other end of the clinical care. <laughs> <laughs> Love your show, Andrew from Boston. Hmm. Nice. Sophia writes, hello, Twipsters. Glad to hear about the weather in the last <laughs> episode. As for this week's guest, my answer is I don't know. Aha. Uh -huh. She gets a book. You could say it's <laughs> dientamibiasis, although I highly doubt it since there is no eosinophilia detected. There's not enough info in your book to explore this further. I'm clueless. What do we do? Well, why don't we wait and see? Personally, if I could lose weight like that, I wouldn't be seeing a doctor. <laughs> I would be thrilled and enjoying it. The only thing I can think of for weight loss is giardiasis, but he reports no bloating. Sorry if this was an easy guess. I would still like to win the book, though. <laughs> and since this email hasn't contributed much, I will try to make up for it by suggesting a pick. There is a free online course. You have to pay if you want a certificate on leishmaniasis by LSHTM. Gives a link to it. Link might have expired by the time you read this, but it's on Future Learn. All the best from a rainy but still quite warm 20 Celsius Greece. Hmm. Does it get winter in Greece? Yeah, they yes, do. Actually. I guess so. It's uh, yeah, sure. it's the same latitude as Italy, right? Yes. Daniel, can you take the next one? I certainly can. Andrew writes, Pongaroa calling. Book not one yet. Third try. Ever hopeful. <laughs> the weather here, a <laughs> little more weather here. The weather here is showers, 14C and overcast. I'll throw in the weather here in New York. It's cold. Um, and we just got uh, through a little bit of a rain and ice storm. My yeah. diagnosis is that his gastrointestinal problems were most likely caused by di diantamoeba fragilis contracted while in Hawaii. The chylomastic mesnili found in the first and second tests is considered practically non-pathogenic, so very unlikely to be the cause in a fit 49-year-old. Defragilis, on the other hand, although often symptomless, is more likely to be the cause of the man's problem. The timing of the symptoms led me to think he contracted defragilis in Hawaii, and the Pakistani restaurant is a red herring or red lamb. <laughs> I assume that the food in the restaurant was eaten by hand, and that would lead one to think of the fecal oral route of infection. But I think the onset of the symptoms after the meal is too short to be realistic. Defragilis is often missed in stool samples so that it may have been overlooked in the first. Vincent was right to ask about the Hawaiian salads. 
what to do next. What to do next is basically beyond my pay grade. <laughs> but my wished for book, wished for pay is a book. And I am still in the running, even if I get that wrong. So here goes the weight loss. What the blank? He says, heck. Most of us would be happy to lose a few pounds as he is symptom-free but still has the parasites. I would suggest checking him for pinworms. Defragilis is well-named as it is the snowflake of parasites and is easily destroyed in stomach acid and does not last long in the environment. There's a hypothesis that helminth eggs could be a way that it enters the body, Trojan horse-like, and thus persists as the pinworm eggs are recycled hand to mouth. One could advise the patient to take a double helping of dessert until the desired <laughs> weight returns. <laughs> Just kidding and brackets here. Iodoquinol is generally the drug of choice for the treatment of dientamoeba. Peromomycin and metronidazole are also effective. Pongaroa tidbit, we have a small river, but it is not great fishing unless you like tuna rhyme with tuna oh unless you like unless you like tuna rhyme mm -hmm. with funna the maori name for eels okay there is however a nearby and fairly deserted beach which attracts surf casters and boat fishers so dixon might like to check it out next time he is in new zealand cheers andrew mm. That's so nice. i didn't know that so apparently tuna is a maori name for eels how about that I would like to go to New Zealand. It's, it's very, a great place. It's very appealing. It's a wonderful place. But, Highly uh, recommend it. I don't know if I'll ever get there. You've been, Dixon, right? Uh, many times, yeah, and I, I enjoy it every time. I've never had a disappointing visit to New Zealand. Speaking of the weather, uh, we yeah, we had some rainy and snowy things. And this morning, driving in, it was zero degrees Celsius. Yeah. Um, here, and now it's maybe one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do you know it's what the sunny, huh? do you know what the current temperature in Singapore is? It's about ninety five. It <laughs> so <laughs> a couple of hours ago I looked and it was um, midnight. At midnight it was now it's five a.m. It's twenty six Celsius. <laughs> right. Right. Oh boy, that's Vincent hot. Vincent only mentions this because he's going there. <laughs> I'm going there on Friday. Yeah, I'm kind of uh, apprehensive. Bring your summer clothes. I'm Bring sad. your summer clothes. I'm kind of apprehensive. I don't really no, have, I don't have summer it. and winter clothes. I have. No, I wear the same clothes all the time. You know, you're going <laughs> to have a great time. Just get over, get over the trip length because it's a long way. But once you get there, you'll have a wonderful time. I can guarantee yeah. you. I'll just think of uh, Daniel in the airport for seven hours. While I'm ah, the, all right. While That's I'm right. on the plane for 17 hours. I know. It I goes know. fast. I'll try and it see. Does. It does. You know, it does. It does. It's, it goes faster going than it does coming back, I'm afraid. Yes, you know, my, my first trip to uh, through, it was really through Singapore, was when I was in medical school and I was on my way to Nepal. And they used to have these uh, ah. clearing houses in the city where you could, if you waited till a few days before and were not picky, you could get great um, – deals on flights. Yeah. And so I ended up flying. I wanted to get to Nepal. So I ended up flying. I ended up in Singapore for seven hours. I was in Bangladesh at one point. I mean, it finally ended up like 40 hours later in uh, Nepal with a very inexpensive fare. But well, you were uh, young back then. <laughs> That's right. Young. That's right. <laughs> or younger. Younger. All right. We okay. have a letter from Jim. Jim Twipsters. Jim is it my turn or your no, turn? I, it's my turn. I haven't gone yet. Oh. This is just the first round. Okay. Dear Twipsters, thanks for your assurance that there would be no public flogging for a wrong answer. <laughs> 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 this case was harder than usual, particularly since Dr. D was not around to pose a hintful yeah. question or two. There was some mention. He was. You were in Pennsylvania fishing. I'm afraid so. There was some mention of a healthy Hawaiian salad and a delicious lamb dish, but I will not be chewing on those today. No red herring either. Anyway, here it goes. Patient could have contracted the protozoan defragilis in Hawaii or California as it is widespread. Exact mode of transmission not understood, but we do know it does not live long in the external environment. Might have come in through the patient's mouth via undetected fecal contamination, perhaps came in along with its non-pathogenic commensal, semesnily, but this is speculation. One thing we do know for sure is that defragilis can keep some shady company by hiding inside the eggs of vicious intestinal worms. 
<laughs> These worms can hatch and may migrate to other parts of the body. We also know that the presence of C. mesnili is sometimes associated with unreliable stool sample test results, including false positives and negatives. Defragilis itself does not cause symptoms in everyone, but it is capable of causing the nausea and diarrhea that this patient had, patient had for a week. It follows that he would lose weight during this time due to dehydration, reduced caloric intake, and inhibited absorption of nutrients. The fact that he has not yet regained all the weight he lost during his illness is not necessarily indicative of an ongoing problem. Since all of his blood work is normal and he is not losing weight, it's more a question about whether his current weight is healthy. In short, two organisms of interest were found in the patient's stool, but there is no direct evidence of another active pathogen. However, because these two particular organisms are sometimes linked to intestinal parasites and because C. mesnili is associated with unreliable test results, multiple deep dives into the stool will be required. Not a good thought. <laughs> we need to find out if defragilis is really there, and if so, is it keeping bad company? If microscopic investigation does not yield a definitive result, PCR testing is always an option. What to do if defragilis is the only pathogen left standing at the end of the day? It could be wiped out with a course of doxycycline, but this has to be weighed against all the regular concerns about overusing antibiotics. This really is a question for his doctor. I would be honored to win a signed copy of your book. Here in Vancouver, it's only it's currently 282 degrees Kelvin. <laughs> <laughs> under partly cloudy skies with rain in the forecast. Twip rules as always. Take care, Jim. Yeah. Right. So James writes, <clears throat> I am writing to you as a new microbiology professor at Rocky Vista University School of Osteopathic Medicine. I also get to teach pathology. After 30 years of private practice in various cancer hospitals doing frozen sections for demanding surgeons, this is a great second career. So, a 49-year-old man traveled to Hawaii and California, Pakistani restaurant. Did he have the red herring? Uh, nausea and diarrhea, stool, OMP with chylomastics and defragilis, feeling better, but 10 to 15 pounds of weight loss persists, HIV negative. Differential diagnosis, one, defragilis could do all this. Chylomastics is usually more a marker organism for some other infection. But as Bart Simpson once said to his father, too easy, Homer, too easy. Giardia could do this. Indeed, it has done it to me. Gave me some pretty good malabsorption and unmasked my, unmasked my familial lactose intolerance. Once I stopped large chocolate chocolate milkshakes at Baskin Robbins, a dark day indeed. Symptoms lessened a lot, and my then young children stopped calling me Mr. Stinky. Giardia commonly gets missed on O&P, but there is a good antigen test. I wonder if this might be sneaky Giardia. Three, Hawaii. These symptoms don't really sound like rat lungworm to me. Clearly, he has picked up some protozoa or something he's gotten into, bad food or water. The sky starts becoming the limit here. Various cestodes, nematodes are on my list. I don't recall if you mentioned a stool, occult blood. Visceral larva migraines for sushi is in either state. Eostolitica, a mild case. Stool ONP has a significant false negative rate for many organisms. Cryptosporidium. As an ID dude, you would, of course, have to consider bacterial infections. Viral seems sort of unlikely with his history, although Hep A is a thought. Did not see liver enzymes. Can't really think of a fungus among us, I suppose. True, true, unrelated. There are other weight loss things like occult malignancy and autoimmune conditions. Any chronic inflammatory state that would creep onto the bottom of my list as well. I do believe I'd start with a couple more O&Ps. Is three still the magic number? And an antigen mm. a test for Giardia before writing this off as defragilis. I also throw in the stool occult blood in my ID prof at um, Mr. Duke's School of Medicine and Basketball. Ralph Corey used to say, a good doc is not smart. A good doc is com complete. But the GI doc likely did that. And I might add, this diagnosis has a lot of commercial potential in a country with massive obesity. <laughs> Asymptomatic, five to f 10 to 15 pounds of weight loss, gold mine. Sound, assigned James, he's an MD and a PhD, an associate prof. That was a good letter. 
Mm. Yeah. Where's Parker, uh, Daniel? Do you know Parker, Colorado? I think Parker's just west of uh, Denver. Okay. Um, I should I should take a look because having lived half my life out there, I would I would hate to get that wrong. Parker is let's see, yeah, just outside of uh, it's in Douglas County, so it's yeah, just outside of Denver. I think maybe south of Denver. Hmm. Looking at looking at a map here, yeah. So a little bit southeast. It's where it's where all the houses look the same, and if you drink too much, you can never figure out whose home is whose. <laughs> 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 it sounds like they have a wonderful view of the um, <laughs> of the eastern tier of the Rocky Mountains, though. You are next, Daniel. <clears throat> Cecilia writes, Dear doctors, I think the symptoms of Dr. Griffin's patient were caused by dientamoeba fragilis. All the newer literature agrees that the organism can cause weight loss and gastroenteritis symptoms. The presence of chylomastic mesnili is probably unrelated to his symptoms since it's widely accepted to be non-pathogenic. Its presence does indicate that the patient probably ate something that was contaminated with feces since chylomastics is spread by ingested contaminated food or water. Since the patient ate salads while on vacation, that could have been the source of the dientamoeba also. Since dientamoeba can be difficult to diagnose in just one specimen, it may have been missed in the first ova and parasite study. Thanks again for your amazing podcast and all the other good work you do. Sincerely, Cecilia down in St. Petersburg, Florida. Hmm. Is that on the West Coast, St. Petersburg? That's a good question. Uh, I'm going. I'm I going think it West is. Coast. I think well, <laughs> West Coast. I thought so. All right, Kevin. A, you got lucky. Kevin writes. <laughs> I didn't plan it. I just you know, <laughs> Polynesian pseudo polyparasitism. Wow, that's a good title. This case mentions Hawaii, which immediately activated my regrettable type one mental response and the availability <laughs> heuristic. <laughs> <laughs> Alternatively, has the word Hawaii just exposed my own crude island stereotypes? Spam, canned meat, not the electronic variety, the hula, lays, grass skirts, angiostrongulus, <laughs> floral shirts, and cornball 50s off-color jokes with the punchline, come on, I want to lay ya. Oof. Yeah. The lay is that thing you put around your neck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I usually build up a case analysis with the patient age, location, exposures, etc. TWIP 177 somehow discounts all of this. The patient's age isn't particularly important. Hawaii, eh? Or is meh the prefer- preferred <laughs> ejaculation? Hawaii is not really a festering disease zone. Never mind Ali Kata's 1964 treaties, parasitic infections of man and animals in Hawaii. Right. Pakistani restaurant, well, exposures could happen anywhere. Let's not impugn the sanitary conditions of any particular ethnic food service. Right. But travel, persistent diarrhea, and weight loss does call for some concern. I'm a little surprised that the initial medical visit resulted in a stool for O&P, or rather low-yield investigation for someone returning from Hawaii, notwithstanding the 82 cases of angiostrongoliasis from <laughs> 2007 to 2017 in Hawaii, though this parasite is not diagnosed via stool. First ONP yielded the humble chylomastics. The dilemma in this case is that our patient has recovered from his episode of diarrhea and weight loss and right. three months later is retested, asymptomatic, and his stool is now positive for chylomastics and dientamoeba. I realize he reports a net five-pound weight loss. However, this is insignificant in my estimation, especially when considering the dismal accuracy of reported and measured body weights in the clinical setting. <laughs> oh, boy. So how to proceed? PD-7 is gratifyingly unequivocal on the status of the not uncommon flagellate chylomastics mesnali. It is considered non-pathogenics by all standard criteria. Of relevance to us is Garcia's comment in her 2016 review, which states that dientamoeba may be mistakenly identified as chylomastics due to a nuclear chromatin similarity. I will leave other chylomastics digressive materials to the vast dumping grounds of my end notes. <laughs> and they are vast. This brings us to Dientamoeba fragilis. Johnson's 2004 review, referenced in PD7, contains one of the strangest anthropomorphisms of recent times. Quote, Dientamoeba fragilis is struggling to gain acceptance as a legitimate pathogen in many <laughs> countries. End quote. 
Johnson's lament could also be read as a political allegory of current events in Washington. <laughs> this flagellate organism was described fairly recently, 1918. Transmission believed to be fecal-oral, what else? Has an imperfectly understood life cycle with a putative cystic form and possible animal reservoirs. Mm -hmm. The trophozoite has a wide size variation, 5 to 15 microns, and is difficult to positively identify. Multiple authors emphasize the importance of making permanent stained stool preparations as the live organism can only be reliably seen in very fresh fecal smears, hence the name Fragilis, named because the organism quickly deteriorates outside of the host gut. Diantamoeba is not included in current multi-array molecular panels. There seems to be a consensus that this protozoan causes diarrhea. Some say up to a third of infected persons may be symptomatic, but there are a few remaining skeptics, CN notes. As an example of adding insult to injury, it's hypothesized that diantamoeba may occasionally be a stowaway inside of a pinworm ova, resulting in yet more polyparasitism. 2019 CDC treatment recommendations, iodoquinol, param paramomycin, or metronidazole tetracycline has also been used. Our current case recalls TWIP-167, wherein a patient was coincidentally relieved of her chronic constipation after tropical travel, and E. Hartmani was a witness to this. TWIP-167 and 177 walk in the shadowlands of medicine, <laughs> where the question can be asked, who do we treat and why? Our asymptomatic and recovered tourist has some diantamoeba. Is it now part of his eukaryome and of possible benefit, or does this belly creeping amoeboflagellate, amoeboflagellate demand extirpation? Most <laughs> practitioners would treat, and most patients would demand pills. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? There may be one universal that unites all political persuasions. A well-functioning gut is desirable. <laughs> Thanks for a solid and regularly moving podcast. Oof, oof. I think that was a pun. Yes, it's a right. <laughs> You should read the uh, um, EndNotes the end listeners. They will be in the show notes, microbe.tv slash twip. I'll just point out a few things here. The <sighs> etymology of chylomastic. So mastig means whip or flagellum, and chylo is lip or lips. Could not find much on the naming of this uh, organism. So then he has lots of notes on diantamoeba, um, at chylomastics as well, and treatments and so forth. Enteroparasitism of paper. He's got some pictures here of chylomastics, nice hand-drawn pictures. He's got a, another illustration as well. Mm -hmm. He says, so whether we considered a chylomastic, in our case, to be a stalking horse, a straw man, an innocent bystander, a mutualist or commensal, it is clear that its eponymous roots led directly to the great protozoologist Felix Mesnil, who was born 150 years ago on this December 12th. Hmm. Worked at the Pasteur Institute for his entire career, director of colonial microbiology. <laughs> so he, he wow. is the one after which this is um, mm -hmm. named. In conclusion, I wave a flagellum in honor of this great Ooh. scientist on the 151st anniversary of his birth, 12th December, 1868. Wow. That's pretty cool, Amazing. isn't it? Amazing. Lovely. Very, very particular. You always write well, Kevin, but that was a particularly good one, don't you think? Yeah, I do. I, I have one quibble, and that is he, <laughs> he mentions that he gained all of his weight back except five pounds. He actually uh, lost 10 pounds and only gained five pounds back. Lost 15, gained five, so he's 10 pounds prior to... Uh, 10 pounds down, that's a, right. Yeah, a mere yeah. quibble. All right, Dixon. Uh, not, no, that's more weight than five pounds, though. Okay. Uh, Peter, course, it, so it depends on your overall weight. If on a 400-pound person, it's a quibble, <laughs> isn't it? No, you're, you're absolutely right. Peter Wright, but this guy was an athletic type, so he probably wasn't overweight. Yeah. Peter writes, greetings to the Knights of the Twip. Uh -huh. The patient mentioned in TWIP-177 appears to be infected with diantamoeba fragilis. Well, yes. <laughs> flagellate, previously thought not to be pathogenic. 
Stark et al.'s 216, 260, 2016 review provides an excellent introduction to this organism. In a somewhat more accessible form, the government of South Australia provides an introduction to defragilis infection that includes in its description of symptoms abdominal pain, diarrhea, excess gas, poor appetite, fatigue, nausea, weight loss, vomiting, and tiredness, while warning that uh, it may be that these symptoms are not caused by defragilis infection. <laughs> <laughs> right, so you're left with a, a terrible choice of believing them or not believing them. Either way, you win. This leaves me with a possible answer and some more questions. Why did the defragilis not show up on the first ONP? Two, is defragilis the source of the patient's symptoms? Three, how was the infection acquired? Four, what is likely to happen to the patient in the future? Five, what treatment is recommended? On the first, parasitic diseases, seventh edition states that while diagnosis using microscopy is possible since trophozoites are fragile and not easily detectable on wet mounts, fixed stained, st stained stool samples are more sensitive. After a thorough discussion of staining technology for detecting defragilis, Stark et al. notes that defragilis trophozoites are shed intermittently and daily shedding is highly variable. And even in, even in symptomatic patients, the examination of a single stool specimen could miss a large number of defragilis infections. It seems then that this parasite is quite easy to miss in an exam, and the negative result from the first ONP could simply be ascribed to chance. Then, is the defragilis the cause of the patient's symptoms, or could there be another cause? Any number of gastroenteric diseases, such as norovirus infection, can cause weight loss, nausea, and diarrhea. The presence of defragilis, like that of non-pathogenic chylomastics mesnally, may be a red herring as defragilis infection does not always clear to, not always lead to, to clear symptoms. As to how the infection was acquired, the fecal oral route is the most likely either via direct transmission or via defragilis catching a right on a pinworm. At the point of examination by Dr. Griffin, the earlier symptoms seem to have died down. Defragilis has been known to be self-limiting, thus it is possible this infection could resolve without intervention. However, to be certain, treatment with trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole would clear any nagging parasites. After writing all of the above, I feel that I am flailing at answers without a high degree of certainty. Thus, in order to end this email on a high note, I enclose three photos taken at Nigeria's Center for Disease Control's National Reference Laboratory, where they are hard at work performing surveillance as part of the effort to eliminate onchocerciasis. I hope that their survey will deliver good news in the future, but I fear that it might not. Then he lists two references for the diantamoeba diagnosis, and uh, sure enough, the three uh, photos that he's listed or pics that he's listed shows people definitely hard at work looking at uh, specimens um, obtained from field studies, I presume, which would allow them to know whether um, Onkosurka is still a problem. Abuja, Nigeria, where it's 30 Celsius. It's hotter than Singapore. Exactly. And this is the <laughs> <laughs> this is <laughs> Wow. Yeah, that's right. I like the last one. The, it's dark. The Luminex machine keeps working on backup even when the lights go out. <laughs> right, right. Oh, man. Cool. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Daniel, you are next. Hello, TWIP professors. This is uh, from the Global Health Track students, um, Dana, Stephen, and Chris. Cool. D. fragilis can cause gastroenteritis-like symptoms as well as weight loss. So symptoms could be entirely due to that, and it is associated with chylomastic mesnili. Could be treated with iodoquinol. Differential diagnosis for his past symptoms could include cryptosporidium, since it can be spread through contaminated water, which could have been used to wash the salads in Hawaii. And most people who have a healthy immune system will recover without treatment. To determine if this organism is still present, another stool sample could be collected to attempt to identify the acid fast oocysts on microscopy. If present, could treat with nitazoxanide. For patient reassurance, you could do another O&P. Otherwise, next steps could be patient education on defragilis and chylomastix mesnili and other possible parasitic infections that could have caused his symptoms. And sincerely, Western U Global Health Track students, Dana, Stephen, and Chris. 
David writes, Dear Twit Professors, hello from the Parasitology Club at the University of Central Lancashire in the beautiful northwest of England. We would like to add our considered opinion for the very tricky case of the gentleman who visited the Hawaiian Islands and then became sick quite quickly after returning home and having a Pakistani meal with his family. Symptoms are quite typical of infection of the gastrointestinal tract, and the diagnostic algorithm should include bacteria, virus, and parasitic causes. As this is a case for TWIP, we have focused on the parasitic options. Onset just 24 hours after dining at the Pakistani restaurant is likely too short for an acute infection with an intestinal parasite, and I hope the gentleman will continue to consider the meal one of the finest that he has eaten and return to the restaurant for more delicious fare from the east. We believe the infection would likely have been contracted in one of the Hawaiian islands. A fantastically detailed treatise on parasites of man and animals in Hawaii by Professor Joseph Alicata identifies a long list of organisms to be found in the islands, but interestingly, no mention of the AP complex and parasites such as Cryptosporidium. Professor Alicata also appears to be responsible for the theory that Angiostrongylus cantonensis, the rat lungwort, may be the causative agent of eosinophilic meningoencephalitis of man in the Pacific region. And we encountered reports that this parasite has been a cause of recent concern for visitors to the islands. There were 10 cases of this nasty parasitic infection in 2018, five to date in 2019, and public health officials indicated the likely cause to be consumption of an infected intermediate host a slug or snail that may have inadvertently wandered into their delicious fresh salads and tarnished their garnish. <laughs> I like that. The most common parasitic causes of acute diarrhea in high-income countries are cryptosporidium and giardia. The patient does not report bloating or foul-smelling fatty stools, more typical infection with giardia, which has been reported on the Hawaiian islands, notably Oahu, and good diagnostic methods are available. So we could assume that two... Negative samples can rule out this organism. Infection with cryptosporidium became more widely recognized as a human pathogenic parasite when it was associated with HIV infection and was one of the AIDS-defining illnesses during the 1980s. AIDS patients suffered intractable diarrhea and severe weight loss at the hands of the parasite. Patient reports significant weight loss associated with his GI disturbance. Average onset for crypto is approximately 2 to 10 days Average seven, duration two to three weeks, self-resolving in immunocompetent individuals, which fit what we have with the patient. However, the Hawaiian Public Health Department indicates that this is a rare in the region, and diagnostic methods in the acute sample should re- have readily detected the organism. The lab findings of Kyla Mezai in both samples is unremarkable. Excellent review of Diantamoeba is provided by Stark and colleagues from Signy, who chart the history of the discovery and provide evidence for and against the role as a human pathogen. On balance, they indicate that there is likely a pathogenic role, but call for more research into this enigmatic organism. Detection in fecal samples can be sporadic. This might account for the initial negative sample followed by a positive. With the limited epi details and symptomology being common to a prolonged bout of diarrhea with concomitant weight loss in the presence of intestinal amoeba indicates a likely exposure to fecal-derived organisms, perhaps on the salad vegetables in- consumed in Hawaii. It's possible that dianthamoeba fragilis could have caused the symptoms and been undetected in the initial sample. So we will take sides with Stark et al. and support the hypothesis that defragilis has been the aggressor in this sad ballad of the bad salad. <laughs> That's great. That is just the sad ballad of the bad salad. We would be proud to receive the signed copy of PD7 and have our collective fingers crossed that we will be lucky enough to be randomly selected from the Twipperati writing in to solve this tricky case. David, of course, is in central Lancashire, Preston. Oh, boy. Very well, lovely. Cool. Very cool. One more, Daniel. All right. Amanda writes, hello, Dixon, Vincent, and Daniel from Tennessee. I'm so excited to finally be writing after lurking for what may be considered an inappropriately long amount of time. I stumbled onto a TWIP podcast while on a small road trip to deliver a bald eagle to the American Eagle Foundation in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. I had run out of episodes to catch up on with my regular podcast and decided to Google science podcasts and my search was rewarded. So thank you for keeping me company as I drove my patient to the sanctuary. 
Mm. Eagles are very sensitive to sounds, and I had to rely on my earbuds to deliver the parasitic parfait of twip. Huh. I should... I wonder if the eagle would have enjoyed listening. I'm not sure. I should note that if I'm a wildlife rehabilitator and a surgical receiving technician at a veterinary specialty hospital, otherwise riding around with an eagle in my truck sounds a bit odd. Due to my work with wildlife, I have had a wonderful opportunity to see some parasites that most people do not get to see. One of my favorite episodes to date focused largely on bot flies. I was probably a little too excited about it, but I've had the opportunity to extract them from various species, including whitetail fawns, raccoons, and eastern cottontails. Perhaps the most interesting extraction was from the testicle of an easter gray squirrel. Upon... Upon his release to his home territory, he was greeted by several other squirrels, and many clicks and squeaks and tail displays ensued. <laughs> I can only translate this exchange as, it's all fun and games until you get a bot fly in your nuts. <laughs> this email is getting rather lengthy, so I will venture my guess for 177. <laughs> I stared at the show notes for this episode for a bit, thinking I was missing something. And I still think that I am, but the testicle botfly is a cool story, and a stab at a diagnosis is a good cover for it. <laughs> Daniel said that Kylo Bastix and D. Fragilis come up in the stool analysis. I'm pretty sure this man had traveler's diarrhea. Chylomastix is non-pathogenic. D. fragilis is a major contributor for intestinal troubles such as those experienced by our patient. Uh, zithromycin should clear him up if my guess is correct. This case is also a good example of how men and women approach the same situation very differently. This man loses 15 pounds, gains five back, and wants to know why he didn't gain the other 10. <laughs> a woman would not care and probably not mention it aloud, lest the whole 15 pounds hear her and come running back. I kid, of course, but only slightly. I look forward to hearing the conclusion of the case, as I feel it seems more obvious than most of the cases. And if I am wrong, I would like to hear about what clue I missed to help in the future. Thank you again for all your time, effort, mm. and dedication. Appreciatively, Mandy L. Well, this particular case gave up for a lot of fun uh, letters, didn't it? <laughs> I think people liked it. <laughs> so yeah, liked. Weight loss. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Hmm. Well, there we well, go. Dear. And now we're stuck. We have to make guesses now, Vincent. Well, Dixon, you weren't here last time, right? We recorded no. without you, if I if I remember. Yeah, he wasn't here. This I time. wasn't here last time, but I read all the case. I read all these uh, letters, of course, uh, before the show, and I also read the case before the show. So I should have an opinion about this, but it's very unlike you to give away the diagnosis <laughs> in the case history. So, you know, I'm tempted to look for a red herring, as the other people didn't. Traveler's diarrhea seems like a reasonable guess, um, but you know I'm I'm still waiting for to hear from Vincent who was there last time. So mm -hmm. no, don't depend on me, dude. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a, a, a diantomy of fragilis seems like a good diagnosis, really, but it's not listed as a, an infection that causes intermediate intermediate weight loss. You know, two weeks you lose weight, the next two weeks you gain it back, the next two weeks you lose it. It's not noted for that kind of a cycling um, infection and disease-causing uh, entity. So um, we've always talked about it as um, it's on the periphery of knowing whether or not it's a parasite or not. It's never been excluded, but it's never been fully included either. So um, let's maybe hope that this time everybody was right in picking mm -hmm. the obvious. You pick the obvious, sometimes you are right about that. And so that's like Occam's razor. So I will, I will go with defragilis as the major cause of his illness, which apparently is he's getting over as he comes to the clinic. So Dixon, you didn't you didn't consider at all lungworm, huh? Rat lungworm. No, oh, God no, no, of course not. Why not? Why not? Totally asympt. Well, uh, lungworm, when it gets to random meninges of the brain, is not a nice thing to to have, and uh, you get headaches and you get all kinds of uh, other symptoms. Plus, you get a raging eosinophilia. So mm -hmm. none of that was part of this uh, case history at all. Yeah, there's no uh, GI symptoms there, are there? 
Not for uh, angiostrodulins. Yeah, because when I heard uh, salad in Hawaii, you know, I immediately. No, no, I agree with you. Thought, I, I but, think uh, this I was guy for that too. But yeah, right. he, this guy had a mild, so he, he just lost weight. So that's right. Couldn't be. Well, I end up going with defragilis because it can yeah. cause these things, yeah. and uh, the Kylo is a uh, red herring, as we say. <laughs> yeah, that's my guess. Exactly. Now yeah, we'll hear from the expert. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So as you point out, this this was you know I was trying to decide do I do I throw this case out? I'm glad I did because it looks like people enjoyed it. Uh, oh, yeah. But you know, here's a man who comes to me already with basically um, a diagnosis and really kind That's of the right. question of well, what do I do now? Um, right. So you know, he he had the the recent stool test which showed the diantamoeba fragilis, and it was actually done at um, I'll say a good lab, a lab I. Um, have confidence in, um, you know, a lot of people brought up the yeah. issue. Did, did he have yeah. that in the initial stool and they, they just missed it. They weren't sure it was done, you know, at some lab that an urgent care out in, um, you know, a non-urban area of, uh, California sent them to, you know, and there's always the issue. You, you never know, um, when someone sends something to a lab, like the reliability. Um, and I think actually from our, um, our, our buddy, um, I will say our gentleman who sends in all the terminal curiosities, Kevin. Mm -hmm. um, Kevin actually sends in, and I think people have the opportunity to go online and look at these, but a lot of drawings and actually even a nice um, illustration from the 1921 um, book where they show um, a bunch of different um, – say, intestinal organisms. So you've got diantamoeba fragilis, you've got chylomastix, you've got giardia and olimax. Um, and, it, you know, with a just a routine O&P without a fixed specimen, you know, it, it, it's unclear how sensitive a single O&P is going to be uh, for picking this up. And so I, I sort of like the idea that um, the clinical syndrome may go along with um, diantamoeba fragilis. But then we also had this great discussion. As I said to the patient, I, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know if we can say that diantamoeba fragilis um, makes people sick. Um, and again, because we have all this sort of confusion um, about it. And I, I love the Australian, you know, comment that, you know, it can <laughs> cause all these diseases or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like you're kind of correct. Like, okay. And the other um, thing about it was that if chylomastics hadn't been there, and if they had not found anything on the first stool exam, but found only diantamoeba fragilis on the second exam, I would have been much more likely to say, you probably had an, an, a disease caused by this organism that we've finally found. Mm -hmm. but, but having found chylomastics opens the door for all the other intestinal infections that you can catch by fecal contamination. And I, you know, that it, it still leaves you wondering um, what to do. This guy is perfectly healthy when he came to see you. And I, so what did you do? <laughs> well, so so I will. I'll give you a little more data. So he had some other other testing. Um, he had um, one of these GI PCR microarrays done, um, looking for you know a whole slew of other um, pathogens. It was well, I'll say organisms. Um, that was all negative. His blood work was completely normal. So so the man was basically doing well, feeling good. And actually, it's it's interesting. It was his wife who was, uh, as he said, was quite annoyed that he was down ten pounds. <laughs> He was like, I don't really care. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> his wife was like, how is this? You eat everything you want, and you know, you're know you 10 pounds even less than you used to be, and you already were thin to begin with. Um, right. So that became, you know, and I think our email address is like, so you know, here you are with, you're a doctor, and you, you could potentially throw um, drugs at this person. And I like the fact that someone brought up our case about 10 back, where the woman went to the DR with her chronic constipation. Now she was happy, doing well, but because the doctor saw something in the stool, felt obligated to treat her, and now she's back to her annoying chronic constipation. So I, I actually thought this was rather interesting and I had a long discussion with the patient about, so um, you're down 10 pounds. You seem completely fine with this. I'm completely fine with this. You have no symptoms. Exactly. Um, I, don't, I don't feel compelled to treat you, you know, so what? I then... So that I then shook the man's hand and then had lunch without washing um, because <laughs> I, I want to have this man's. So <laughs> I want to have this man's, what is it, eukaryome? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. eukaryome. That's good. 
so yeah, so I just I did not treat this man. I He's um, untreated, he was, but will you ask him to come back for a, a monthly checkup or something? No, no. I told him as long as he is fine, he is symptom free. Um, right. I, you know, I, I have no no inclination. I don't feel any um, need to treat him. And even though he might be able to pass this infection on to somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I told him the normal stuff about, you know, you should be, you know, like everyone else washing your hands. And of yeah, and that that is an interesting issue. Like, so, you know, let's say this man passes this on and we start having everyone in America weighs about 10 pounds less. That might not be so <laughs> bad. <laughs> Well, there's no guarantee that you'll stop losing weight either, though, is there? Uh, Maybe well, some people the, go on to lose too much weight. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. They've done some um, work on this organism in, in mouse models. Right. And um, at least in the mouse model, there seems like there's a reset of the weight set point. So it's not really? as though the mice continue to lose How weight. Interesting. They tend to lose a certain amount of weight. And then if you measure the infected mice and the non-infected tend to basically have a, a significant statistically and also a few, you know, notable difference in weight at the end. And not necessarily continued symptoms or anything. So it's really interesting, I think. Um, we feel this obligation, right? Oh, I found something. It's in the stool. I got to give you these drugs. Sure, sure, um, sure. I, I'm sort of of the, um, if you don't have a problem, I'm not going to fix it. Right. Well, this, hmm. this, uh, this could lead to a much longer discussion some other time. But I've been following very closely the mouse model data with regards to weight gain and weight loss and the microbiome content. And there is a one-to-one -one relationship between mice who lose weight with a certain microbiome from mice that were thin to begin with. They were bred to be thin to mice that were bred to be obese. And the microbiome of the thin mouse was transplanted, transfected, or however you want to say, into the uh, fat mouse, which was cleared of its own gut tract uh, microbiome and replaced with the thin mouse microbiome. And sure enough, the fat or overweight microbiome mouse now became thin, just like the thin ones. And, and it implied a very close correlation between the microbiome and the way in which they handle, um, let's say, fats or something that they're just, they're not quite sure of what's going on, but it, they're pretty sure that it's due to the microbiome. So maybe D. fragilis affects the microbiome of us in a way which selects for the microbiological organisms which favor um, whatever the mechanism is in mice. We probably have a similar mechanism in our own gut tracts, and so perhaps that's worth exploring as a way of looking at weight loss. How would you yeah, explore you know, that, yeah. Dixon? How? Yeah. Well, you can start with germ-free animals first, and then uh, they actually have germ-free primates as well. Um, you could sort of dissect out the microbiome to find out which microbes are there, which are th the ones that are responsible for this. If that turns out to be the case, then you can go look for the same ones in, in other – and by the way, transplanting microbes into one patient from another patient, as long as they're considered normal inhabitants of the gut tract – carries little risk with that. So you can actually do the transfection um, experiments in people and run clinical trials to see whether or not there's some validity here. Transplant. Be transplant. a huge not find transfection. if it were. Not transfection. Transplant. But transplant, yeah. that's fine. Yeah, no, there's a, this is sort of a big, Transform I'll say, Great. <laughs> yeah, they actually, I mean, they refer to this as fecal transplants, and and it, it has a, a fair a fair foothold in um, Clostridium difficile colitis. Right. Um, and there's been some recent sort of FDA as you know, you, you got to be careful about how you do this because um, you know there, there's a lot in there, and um, there were That's a couple true. deaths. Um, you know, within the last year where people were given um, stool that contained pathogens and, and there were issues. But and, and it is interesting. I mean, I, I, I find this fascinating how much we don't I, know because we, we like to think it was very simple. We're like, oh, no, you got to exercise more, eat less. And people huh. all the time say, you know, I exercise, I eat less. But <laughs> exactly. here's my he, in this case, here's my husband and he, he eats everything he wants, barely exercises, you know, he's fairly athletic, right. but he's, right. he's always like thin and yeah. And they've done uh, studies in, in areas of Africa where they've actually looked at this sort of, um, they call it the starvation microbiome versus the obesity microbiome. And yeah. uh, 
Yeah. It's really interesting. So, yeah, so I, I was not ready to jump in and mess unless I felt um, obligated. Sure. But, uh, yeah. It's it's an emerging literature, which I'm sure is going to eventually find out what's going on. Yeah, and it's not I just aesthetic, see. right? I mean, we're sort of into no, the right. aesthetic, but there's huge health benefits to having an ideal body weight versus um, this obesity epidemic that is driving hypertension sure. I mean, and diabetes. It's gotten, and, it's gotten so bad, Daniel, that I'm sure you're aware of this too. When you travel by air, you know they're tra- they're charging you for your luggage now because before it was never a problem, but now people are 10 percent or 20 percent over their normal body weight. And it's like adding 10 more people to the airplane with the same number of seats. And the the plane wasn't designed for that purpose. So I think we're really expending a lot of uh, wasted fuel uh, carrying the same people around that are now very much overweight compared to what they used to. It's not in every country, though, you know. It's Not in every country. You're absolutely right. (laughs) Yeah. But Europe Europe is not (laughs) in. in Europe is there. And remember, they're referring to the obesity increase as an epidemic. And when you put the word epidemic on something, uh, you're obviously indicating that there's a causal agent involved in this thing. So that that's probably a mistake, but that's what the epidemiologists are calling it. Calling it. There's an epidemic of teenage obesity. There's an epidemic of type 2 diabetes. There's an epidemic of uh, obesity in, in uh, older people, that sort of thing. When you yeah, so when I was gonna first... I was gonna jump back in on, and I think this is an interesting discussion issue. Is you know, so here I am sending this infectious man out in the world <laughs> with like, you know, well, you know, all of us, all of us have stool, which is full of nastiness, right? <laughs> so yeah, that his microbes could save her ten pounds of weight, though. I'm yeah. sure she wouldn't complain about his. Uh... Uh, refusal to, uh, <laughs> to, to shrug off his weight loss. <laughs> Maybe it'll lead to something good. Who knows? Hmm. All right. There we have it. Shall we move on, gentlemen? Absolutely. We have a we have a paper. I believe we do have a paper. We have a we paper. Do. This was selected by Daniel or Dixon. I don't remember. Dixon. 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 I did a paper from Science called. It's- Validation of the protein kinase PFCLK3 as a multi-stage cross-species malarial drug target. <laughs> Simple title. <laughs> many authors from many institutions, University of Glasgow, the Swiss right. Tropical and Public Health Institute, University of Leicester, GlaxoSmithKline, University of Oxford, and others. What did you like about this, Dixon? Well, I've, I've, been a big fan of research on malaria for a long time now since they've deciphered the genomes of both the mosquito vector, the uh, parasite itself, and human, uh, expecting something miraculous to emerge. And this might be an example of that. Um, What they did was they surveyed, I believe it was 36 or 38 different uh, protein kinases from the parasite with a, a, a a library of inhibitors that they acquired from various places throughout the world. This was a massive study to find out if they could find anything that interfered with any of these protein kinases. And lo and behold, out of the black of black of uh, misunderstanding and, uh, and, and false leads and this, everything else comes a compound which interferes with one of the 36 protein kinases. And not only does it do that, all of the species of malaria have it, including all the the, uh, the non-primate malarias, like Plasmodium burgii. And it interferes not just with one stage of the parasite, and I'm spoiling the whole pro- paper by probably telling you all this, but when I read the the body of this paper, I got tremendously enthusiastic about maybe finally there's light at the end of the tunnel in terms of a chemotherapeutic agent that has some possibility of making a real big difference. It doesn't matter which species of malaria you have, just give them this drug and they'll get better. <clears throat> of course, they also went on to describe a lot of um, uh, in vitro studies in which they actually selected for resistance and they could actually pinpoint in the um, protein kinase itself where that mutation had occurred and what effect it had on this on the activity of that protein kinase. So, so I, I love this paper for all those reasons. Yeah, those that resistance is too bad because that's kind oh. of not good. But 
And also, we don't we don't know if this has any side effects in people yet. That's not been tested, right? Don't you remember what Alexander Fleming said though when he delivered his <laughs> Nobel Prize winning um, lecture? I should remember. I was there. <laughs> You don't look that old either. Uh, no, he said, let it be a warning to you that even though I've discovered a, a chemotherapeutic agent that has great effects against microbes, I have also conducted studies in my laboratory, which shows that there are mutations. Or he didn't call them mutations, which are there are varieties of the same parasite, which can be selected for, which are non-responsive to that agent. So uh, even at the very beginning of antibiotic use, uh, we were painfully aware of the lifetime Mm-hmm. of how long these agents could be used yeah, for. for sure. Well, if you use them in combinations, I suppose. Yeah, you can, that's, uh, that's, you that's can, the idea. You can do better. And so uh, we're getting to the point where we can do that, I suppose. With the malaria. AIDS epidemic is a good example of that. Absolutely right. Triple therapy. So, or tuberculosis to bring yep. us back. That's right. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So at any rate, that's that's what really tickled my fancy. Now, about. for for Sophia in Greece, uh, stick with us, okay? We'll try and... <laughs> <laughs> Try to make it understand. Down. So here's the thing, Sophia. Protein kinases, they're enzymes that attach a phosphate group to proteins. And this is important. This happens to be a major way that cells regulate different activities, a whole range of activities, by putting a phosphate on or taking it off. And those are called protein kinases. And the um, <laughs> the all of the protein kinases encoded in a genome is called the kinome. K I N O M E. And the parasite kinome consists of 65 different Six protein five. kinases. That's incredible. 65. And, and a number of labs have knocked them out one by one and shown, you know, which are non essential, in which case you don't want to make a drug against that, right? Because it wouldn't have any effect. <laughs> and they've, they've found some essential ones. And uh, in this paper, they have focused on PF. Plasmodium falciparum CLK3. And do you want to know what CLK stands for? <laughs> Casein like kinase. It's okay, it doesn't matter. They focused on this one and they made the protein. And there are two forms, one and three, that they make. They make the protein, they use the protein, the purified protein. Right. The protein kinase to screen all these libraries that Dixon mentioned, which. They have, they have wonderful names. One is called the Trecantos Antimalarial Set of 13,000 Compounds. Trecant- <laughs> Doesn't that mean three singers? <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great name. And then there's the Protein Kinase Inhibitor Set, and then there's others. You can buy these, actually, Sophia, if you want. Yes. You could probably order them. But why would you, of course? <laughs> <laughs> and they can set up high-throughput screens, which means they can run assays and ask so the, they have the protein, so they have an activity, which is adding a phosphate to something, and they can ask what drugs inhibit it. And they get, as Dixon said, they have one called TCMDC-135051, which had the highest activity and uh, selectivity for this particular PFCLK3. Uh, and it didn't work really well against human, the, the human ortholog of that protein kinase, which I guess is good. Maybe it won't have side effects, but you just, right. you, you, don't know. you just don't know. That's right. Um, what I think is very cool, so that's, and they, these inhibit the parasite, uh, uh, which we will get to later, but what I think is very cool, so they want to know, just because we have uh, an inhibitor of this kind, it doesn't mean it actually is the mechanism of, of uh, inhibiting the parasite, the parasiticidal activity, right? Right. So they selected mutants. As Dixon said, yes, yes, and they did whole genome sequencing. <laughs> That's right, and identified mutations. In some of them, there are mutations in the gene encoding the protein kinase, which is cool. And then in another one, it was a totally different gene, which they think is uh, involved in the activity of the kinase. So this kinase seems to be regulating RNA splicing. Right, and um, the other protein, the gene encoding a protein involved in. Uh, the activity of the spliceosome also led to resistance, which is which is quite interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's one bit of evidence that this kinase is actually the target of the drug, right? Because if you select for resistant malaria, you get mutations in the gene. But they didn't stop there. They they went further, and this is where I think it's really cool. So they have different um, proteins. 
different kinases that are related but have different sensitivity to this inhibitor, this TCMDC. And they look at the amino acid sequences and they make hybrids between the sensitive and the, and the more resistant one. They exchange amino acids and they make a protein, a recombinant variant protein that has more resistance to the uh, drug. And then they put that into the genome of the parasite. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and they show that the parasite is now more resistant to the drug. Did I, did I make that clear, everyone? Isn't that cool? <laughs> Very. Sophia, you got it? I don't mean to select you, but I want to make sure you're getting it. Because it hasn't been neat. a long time since we could do all of this, by the way. I mean, it, it yeah. means you have to culture the parasites in vitro. You have to be able to transfect them with genes. And then you have to be able to select with these in vitro assays. And it's just an incredible change from, let's say, 20 years ago when you you could raise the mosquitoes okay and you had the animals to infect, but you didn't have any of these molecular tools to play with. And now, I think this is fabulous. Dixon, if I give you, give you a, a dish of malaria parasites and I said, assay the activity of this drug, what would you measure? Well, just count them? Would you count them? Yeah, I think that's what they do. They just set them up in a culture system. In this case, it has to be anaerobic. And uh, you wait overnight, and you, you, you know what you've put into the plate, and you've done your counts before you add the drug, and you've got a, another plate where you just put in saline and the plate with the drug. And, and the next morning, you do the same assays to see which stages are present. Mm -hmm. And in the case of the drug, you've got the same stage there. Whereas the plate that didn't have the drug in it went on to reproduce and produce other forms of the parasite as well. So they say here that the drug prevents trophozoite to schizont transition. What, Correct. What, explain that. Uh, well, the, the organism goes through a number of morphological changes before they divide. And so they, they start out as a little bitty parasite that enters a red cell, or it looks like it enters a red cell, but it actually is in a vacuole created by the red cell. Mm. And that's called the ring stage, because it looks like a ring. It's got a little blue dot at the top, which is the nucleus, and then this little circle of cytoplasm. And as it starts to mature inside the red cell and feed on hemoglobin, actually it's the globin part that it's feeding on, it changes its shape and grows until it reaches a certain size, and then it divides. And that's the schizont. So the, the, the difference between the trophozoite and the schizont stage is that there's only one trophozoite inside of every red cell. But when it divides, of course, then you've got a number of new organisms produced. Mm -hmm. But by the way, they're all connected by the same cytoplasm until the very last minute until they exit from the, para from the uh, parasitized red cell. Hmm. So it's easy to see, though. It's very, very simple to see. They have a nice Drug graph here where they, they yeah. compare they different do. They drugs. They have pictures of them. They have pictures, they have pictures of the parasites. And then they have, it, you know, they have that's them. That's right. They have a nice graph comparing other drugs. Yes. Like artemisinins, chloroquine, pyrimethamine, etovacone. And this is kind of in the middle there, TCMDC, in terms of right. the time it takes to reduce the parasite load. And, and notice that no matter when they put the drug in, or unless you haven't gotten to that one yet, uh, it, it erupts the life cycle no matter when you put it in. When in the in the morphological stages, you mean, right? Yes, yeah. yes. Except for the last one. When you put it in at 48 hours, you've already got skies on, so you can't interfere with that process because it's already happened. Mm -hmm. um, they also look at uh, if it's able to reduce transmission to mosquitoes. That's right. So in other words, they treat the parasites and then they let mosquitoes take a blood meal. I guess this is just blood in a tube. It's not an actual animal, right? And No, uh, that's right. You can get them to feed through a membrane of some sort. Blood, and then they can that's measure right. how many oocysts yeah. are in the gut of mosquitoes. Yep. Notice you have to have an insectary for the mosquitoes, right? You need an insectary, yes. Which you can't so that's get. why there's so many names on this paper. Yeah, you need. I saw an insectary in Texas this this fall. It's pretty cool. Right. So it reduces the tr transmission by fifty percent, and they say that's likely to have a major effect in field conditions where infection rates in mosquitoes are usually less than five percent. Right. Less than five percent of mosquitoes are infected in the field. If you just caught a hundred mosquitoes, less sure. than five percent would be 
malaria positive. Is that what that means, Dixon? Yes, that's exactly right. That's huh. exactly right. Yes, yes, that's what it means. So, Daniel, are you excited by this? I I am actually, and there there's several aspects, and I yeah. So um, I guess we'll also to address Sophia. <laughs> the, the nice thing the nice thing that science does is they they do these one page research article summaries where they kind of point out you know so you get to see all this complicated science but but what's the point and um, you know I, I am a little worried right as as you mentioned Vincent like they were able to quickly generate mutants that are resistant to this but you know that, that's okay. Uh, but they showed that uh, blocking this kinase affects several stages. They show that it affects um, the liver stage, that the infected hepatocyte stage. They show that, as as you guys were talking, there's going to be an impact on the erythrocytic cycle. Mm-hmm. Um, particularly, mm-hmm. it's going to block when the sky skyzons, right, all these small um, multiplied forms are going to egress out. It's going to block gametocyte development. That That's huge. Exactly. That prevents an infected person from producing the gametocytes, which will then end up in the mosquitoes. Um, the interesting issue, I'm not sure how you get this molecule into mosquitoes and have the impact on the exflagellation um, phase in the mosquito, but I don't know, maybe there's a way to do that as well. But no, I, I think that this is uh, this is great stuff. And I was going to sort of uh, ask Dixon, boy, is malaria still a, a problem? Like, haven't we got rid of that yet? <laughs> Wait a um, minute, but, you just got back from the malaria zone, is it? <laughs> I know. I So I just, yeah, I just got back, right, from sub-Saharan Africa. And what made our job, like, harder this time is um, Stella, one of the nurses that I usually work with, a couple days after I had arrived, she came down with malaria her daughter oh, Monica came down with so we were we were basically short staffed I, I saw oh. Stella right you know the day before I left she was better Veronica was getting better but you know it, it, this is still a tremendous problem one of the big three killers it's true um, and we need we need more we need more tools and it's great to see this you you mentioned getting the drug into mosquitoes well, I think the idea would be you treat people and then yes. when Mosquitoes take a blood meal, they take the drug, and they show in this, that's what this experiment does. If you take a blood meal of parasites right. that are drug-treated, you inhibit uh, infection in mosquitoes. So maybe that's what happens. Because this, yeah. this is... Great, yeah. That cool. uh, implies that very little drug is necessary to actually make it happen. Mm-hmm. So you may wonder, Sophia, how does this work? Well, this this kinase, this protein kinase, which is the target of the drug, is involved in making mRNAs. And so it, it ruins the production of many, many, many mRNAs, and that's why it can have such... Over half of them, it said, right? Yeah, they, they did an RNA-seq experiment, and they many, many RNAs are messed up. Exactly. So this is having widespread effects, and um, that's why the so many stages are affected in the in the parasite. So, so it, it's got promise. Um, I just worry about the resistance, but maybe if you, some Daniel, uh, what could you combine it with? Uh, well, I think right? the nice thing is, so this group talks about there being 36 kinases that are really essential for the blood stage survival. Yeah. So yeah, instead of just using one, you know, you could potentially have um, this approach that we use um, for HIV treatment that really um, comes yeah. from tuberculosis treatment where you use multiple drugs. So why not block several protein kinases mm-hmm. um, instead of a single drug? And then you're forcing basically the the plasmodium has got to overcome every Every one of those, and you know, you create hopefully enough of a barrier that it it becomes untenable, or the mutation takes such a survival impact, such a survival toll, um, that we actually succeed here. Yep. Well, I know what I would do if I was the uh, director of this program, and that was I would um, look for another similar inhibitor from uh, more drug screening uh, libraries to attack the same molecule in a different way. Just like you have triple therapy now for, um, for the AIDS virus. And I'm, I'm pretty sure each one of those therapies blocks the replication of the virus at different parts of its life cycle so that you're not attacking the same molecule with three different drugs. But in this case, you've got your target really honed in. I mean, if you can find multiple ways of killing off this protein kinase, with two or three drugs, the likelihood is that the mutation won't occur. And th- that is to say, one of those mutations might, but having all three in the same molecule would be very unusual, I would think. 
Yes. You know, it's, a, yes. it's a interesting. Yeah, no, I mean, with HIV, we started up basically just targeting reverse transcriptase, right, with our yeah. – um, basically our dummy nucleotides that were chain terminating. Then we had small molecule direct inhibitors, but now we've also got integrase inhibitors, protease inhibitors. We sure, even sure. less used entry inhibitors. So, yeah. Yeah, you either go after multiple. Um, it would be interesting to see if they're all essential. All 36 of these uh, protein kinases are essential for all of the species of malaria. That's remarkable if they are. I mean, that would be... Also, well, should we should mention that Hep C treatment has been revolutionized by multi drug treatment now yeah. as well, right? Yeah, we used yeah. to have just one drug, didn't work That's well. It. Now we have many. We combine them, and you, Hep C is now curable. And Hep C can you can get, there's no latent stage, right? As for HIV, so you can theoretically cure a person after X months of treatment. Yeah, how high, many drugs do we? High ninety percent success. Yeah. yeah. How many drugs do you need for tuberculosis treatment, uh, Daniel? So the standard is we start with four drugs, and after two four. months we drop down to two. Um, usually, and we know two. each one works. Um, we do. We do. Right, and they're all in different processes, I presume. Mm -hmm. And also, some are more important in acidic environments. So, for sure. instance, if you have a cavity, and yeah, it's. Uh, and if anything, we've got a few new ones in the in the arsenal. So, right, you're going to have to keep getting new ones if you want to actually have a big effect on this one, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, unfortunately, um, you know, you're still we still have um, about a million deaths a year due to tuberculosis, That's despite all this. So, um, tremendously difficult challenge. Yep. So we're still desperate for a vaccine rather than a new drug, I would say. Yeah. I mean, we don't talk about it much on TWIP, but no, that was a huge problem in the area where I was in Africa. So we definitely were seeing people with tuberculosis coming into yeah. clinic and not only horrible for them, but the transmission to um, you know, everyone in the clinic and in the communities. Exactly. All right. Let's um, move on here. I forgot to give a book away. Let's give a book away. <laughs> did forget. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, but the, the listeners didn't forget. Trust me. <laughs> so we had 10 people guessing. Right. Uh, I, I left Kevin out because he's won one. So yeah, here yeah. we go. Random number between one and 10. Are you ready? Number seven. Ow. Nice. Number seven is Peter. Peter in Nigeria. I don't know if you've won one. I did wonder Peter, but... Uh, if uh, you have not, please send me your address and phone. I assume it's going to go to Nigeria, because, and that's why I need a phone. And to all of you others, please keep trying. The, the odds are pretty good. You know, if we get 10 guesses each time and there's some of the same people, it gets even better. So please don't give up. You will get one. Okay? Yeah, don't stop trying. So Peter from Nigeria is the winner. And uh, next, uh, do we have a hero, Dixon? We do. We do. In fact, we have a whole cluster of heroes that uh, welled up in my memory uh, as I was uh, walking the halls of the latest ASTM and H meeting down in Washington about a couple of weeks ago. So uh, I was reminded of the fact that I miss these people who I used to regularly hang out with and go out to dinner with and sometimes skip a few afternoons of meetings and go off to museums and look at exotic furniture and tell jokes until three in the morning. Um, and this is one of those people. I'm looking at his picture right now, and tears are coming into my eyes because Dr. Myron G. Schultz uh, was a, a, a lifer at the CDC who had a, uh, degrees in uh, veterinary sciences as well as the medical sciences and uh, I'll just read his obituary. Um, he died on March 5th, 2016. Um, and he was a, one of the great heroes of our time and, and probably unrecognized as a hero until we just said he was a hero right now. Dr. My he was modest as hell. Dr. Myron G. Schultz, whose detection of a cluster of pneumonia cases in the early 1980s helped public health officials identify the AIDS epidemic, died on February 19th in Atlanta. He was 81. The cause was pulmonary hypertension, his wife Selma said. Dr. Schultz, an infectious disease epidemiologist with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, created the Parasitic Disease Drug Service to provide physicians with medicines to treat rare illnesses, 
One was pentamidine, described for patients with African sleeping sickness. It was also made available to treat patients with pneumocystis pneumonia in the early years of the AIDS epidemic when few alternatives were available. In August of 1981, in quotes, because we were providing pentamidine, cases of pneumocystis in adult males quickly came to our attention, and that was the opening salvo for the AIDS epidemic, Dr. Schultz recalled in a 2012 interview with the Global Health Chronicles, a journal published jointly by the Centers for Disease Control in Emory University. Dr. Schultz, who was known as Mike, was the Director of Parasitic Diseases in the Division of Epidemiology at the Centers for Disease Control. He also founded the Traveler's Health Unit and developed a brochure called Health Information for International Travel, now known as the Yellow Book, to advise international travelers about health risks. Myron Gilbert Schultz was born in the Bronx on January 6, 1935, son of Everett and Ruth Schultz. His father was a diamond dealer. He graduated from the Bronx High School of Science, Cornell University's College of Veterinary Medicine, and Albany Medical College. He was working as the track veterinarian at Saratoga Raceway in upstate New York when he decided that he would rather practice on humans. I had a unique life, he recalled in the 2012 interview. I would work at the racetrack in the evening and then go and deliver babies at the hospital. (laughs) In addition to his wife, the former Selma Rosenthal, he is survived by his daughter, Naomi Maas, their son, Dr. Joseph Schultz, a sister, Faith Zubaski, 13 grandchildren and six great-grandchildren. <laughs> Dr. Schultz's curiosity took him beyond the scores of field investigations he supervised. He once theorized how Robert Louis Stevenson was able to complete two versions of the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in six days and six nights. <clears throat> he burned the first without rest and yet remained unattired. I found a notion from Stevenson's stepson that his mother, Fanny Osborne Stevenson, was an avid reader of The Lancet in order to find anything that might help her husband, Dr. Schultz said, referring to the venerable medical journal. And sure enough, six weeks before Stevenson wrote Jekyll and Hyde, there was a paper in The Lancet about how good cocaine is for laryngeal disorder. He can... (laughs) (laughs) To top it off further, when it was all done weeks afterwards, Stevenson said, well, I didn't write it. My brownies wrote it for me. (laughs) Nice. And that, that was, that was Mike Schultz in a nutshell. He was, he was all over the place and he did everything with quality and, and, uh, style and humility. He was one of my all time favorite people to meet. Cool. Very good. I remember pentamidine, they were, CDC was giving it out and they said, oh, this is too much. We never give this much out. I know. What's going on? Exactly. That's exactly. Very cool. That's very cool. Yep. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. Now, Daniel, I have a feeling you're out of cases, right? <laughs> that, that. <laughs> Far from it. <laughs> now, if anything, the, the challenge is always, you know, in my list of cases, which which one um, to do next and because um, we're also we're coming up on a um, a landmark. We um, are. This is the 99th case that I um, will yep. be introducing to our listeners. Hmm. And the next case, which will be, I, I believe, in January, is going to be the 100th clinical case that I will have presented on uh, TWIP. Fantastic. So we've been doing this for a while. We have. So. Indeed. All right. So what do we have today? Okay, so this um, let, let's get everyone in the context. So this is a case. I'm going to be doing a few from uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, so I've traveled um, rather far to Uganda. I've traveled to the eastern um, border of Uganda with Kenya. And I am up in the mountains under the shadow of Mount Elgon. Um, which people may know of, that's where Kittim Cave is, where something called Marburg virus keeps coming out of. Mm. Apparently, they have these massive caves up above us in the in the mountain where um, there's a high salt content. So the, the elephants dig, and they dig these deep caves, and they're full of um, bats and pythons and uh, apparently big tourist attraction. And... Um, we are we are below, so the the water's running down from the mountains. A lot of people are getting their um, drinking water from the nearby stream, 
um, including the two young lads that we'll be uh, discussing today. Um, and and I love the quote. I brought this up when I was there. Um, I was. It, it's about a. It's about an hour walk from where um, the guest house is where I stay to the clinic. And uh, I was taking that walk with Godfrey, one of the Ugandan um, male nurses um, who has now been circumcised and is now a, able to participate in leadership decisions. And, and we saw some of um, some of the young um, boys, much like the two boys we're going to be discussing, who are gathering water from one of the local streams. And he said to me, you know, Dan, uh, they believe that if they get the water first thing in the morning, that it's clean and safe to drink. And with a little bit of a pause, he said, but that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you're correct, Godfrey. So, so two, um, two young Ugandan boys come into our clinic. Um, and, and this is a, this is a busy Monday. I think we saw about 140, um, individuals this this day and it's just two consult rooms so we're, we're very busy seeing a lot of people and um, this is in the afternoon now and um, the the two young boys come in and I and I say to the older boy and there, there's about 15 different dialects in the area so um, so the nurses helping with the um, with the translation actually I, I saw this um, these individuals with Godfrey I believe um, who now has finished his nurse training and is learning to do consultations. And um, I said to the oldest um, of the two boys, you seem a bit young to already have a son. And, um, and you know, in, in my assessment, I'm looking at him, he looks to be, I'll say, about eight or nine. Um, but he actually turns out he's 15. So he's quite small for his uh, uh. for his um, age, and he's he's there without his parent, um, and he's there with his one year old um, younger brother. And you know, I, I'm very curious why he's there without a parent because usually um, the children come in with with a mom, usually sometimes a dad, usually the mom. But he's there without his parents, and he was sent in by his grandmother, who's busy taking care of some other children. And he's there because his one-year-old brother has been passing um, worms in his stool. And so he, he's there for that. So um, I, I ask him a little bit, can, can you describe these worms? Um, and uh, he, he says, yes, he's able to see the worms because there's a fear of very young children using the um, drop toilets. And I think the fear is that the child might fall into the abyss. Um, and that fear is had by the parents as well as the child. So, so this boy is, is defecating in plain sight, and you're able to actually see the worms. And the 15-year-old the boy says, um, they're long, and they are white, and they are flat. Now, I, I will tell you that I say to the boy, really? <laughs> that doesn't make sense to me. Why don't we show you some pictures? And fortunately, here we are, and we have this this great book. Dixon, can you guess what book I happen to have with me? Um, it's red. It has a red cover. <laughs> so, <laughs> we, we have a few. We have a few copies of Parasitic Diseases Seventh Edition around the clinic. So I have an atlas in the back too, right? <laughs> yes, yes. So we page through, and first I show this this boy a a, a worm. Um, we'll say something that is long and white and flat and he shakes his head no that that's not um but then we turn to a page where there are these i will say a pinkish um almost a fleshy color um worm these worms are actually we'll say we we were able to gather from the boy maybe we'll say in about an eight inch um, in length, round, pinkish-looking worms, and he actually he he you know eyes light up when he sees them and points that that's actually what he's been seeing in his um, little brother's stool. Right. Um, and the little brother, um, when we examine him, he he um, he looks a little small for a one-year-old, um, and he has a rather protuberant um, abdomen. His belly sort of rounded and sticking out. Um, and also, you know, because this 15-year-old boy is there, I, I examined him as well. He also, as mentioned, he's small for stated age. He also has a bit of a protuberant belly. Um, and I think I'm going to leave us there. So what do we think is going on and what do we do? 
So they drink water. They all drink water from this uh, stream, right? They what they what they do, and and some of the families do this. And you know, as mentioned, they go early in the morning when theoretically it's still clean, and they gather um, water, and that's the water that they're drinking. And and I have to say that this has been a bit of an issue because they just had a a very significant cholera outbreak. Uh, mm. Number number of people died from that, yeah. um, and then after the cholera was um, under control, they had um, a fair number of cases of enteric fever, so typhoid, right. and actually a, a number of the uh, staff at the clinic um, were sick with that, um, and so now they are back to drinking the water from the stream. And and what do they eat? Do they eat things uh, that they collect or stuff? No, no, that's that's an excellent question because I'm I'm got a little project going on this. So the the diet tends to be um, we like to say very high carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. So they um, they eat these um, they're called chapatis. So it's uh, basically a flour, but it's deep fried, um, and so they'll often have this. They'll eat yams and what they call Irish, which are like a white potato versus other types of root um, vegetables. Um, a fair amount of cabbage, um, some rice, and they also make um, this um, sort of a white, um, almost like, um, what, what do you call the yellow um, sort of Mexican dish where you take a, a corn flour and you mix it up? Tortilla? Uh, enchilada? Enchilada? No, but basically it's a white, it's a white corn meal um, sort of starch. Tortilla, it's a tortilla. Yes. Polenta, I guess, would be sort of a. Oh, it's it's I, like a polenta, but without much see, taste. Um, oh. And they also oh, um, a bit of beans, um, some soybeans and other beans. Right. And um, not very often, but occasionally you'll eat maybe pumpkin, pumpkin leaves, and um, you might have something that's similar to a collard type green, but again, not not very much. Um, and bananas. There's actually a type of banana. It's a very starchy um, banana that they'll um, eat as well. Do they do their own farming? So a lot of the farming in the area is actually, say, a cash crop um, for um, coffee beans. Some of the best coffee I've ever had. So there's a lot of coffee. Um, and, yeah, some of the local stuff they are growing would be the bananas, the cabbages. And this do you have any idea of what they use for fertilizer? Um, you could probably guess. Um, and the I, rice, when you get to the lower areas, is where you see the rice patties. So that's my that's, – mm. I'm going to stop asking questions at this point. <laughs> and the uh, these veggies are, are washed probably in the stream water also, right? <laughs> yes. Probably. If you want to call it washed. Got it. Well, you, yeah. uh, that's true. That's a good point, Vincent. A very good point. Oh, some carrots. Occasionally you can get some carrots. Got it. No meat. Right. Um, no. Not a lot of meat. I mean, meat would be rare. Now, during Fish. the time I'm there, there's actually a big outbreak of a hoof and, hoof and mouth disease in the cattle. So there's no beef in uh, the Baduda region. Um, but that would, again, be a very wealthy thing um, to be consuming. Um, some people will maybe chicken. Again, uh, a rare thing. Maybe at Christmas <clears throat> you might have chicken. Um, rarely goat. But meat is not a big part of the diet. As you get closer to the lake, um, you, you might have fish. That's right. How long had the boy been passing worms, did you ask? <laughs> it's been a long time. And did the brother ever pass worms? Did you ask him? So I asked the brother. That's a good question. Um, and he he's been using the uh, the toilet, the abyss. Like so, his stools are dropping so he off. Know. To, so he doesn't know. He doesn't know. He hasn't been able to mm -hmm. see his stools. Okay. This abyss. Where does it go? Into the stream. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they. You know, that's a great question. They dig these deep. Pits, and then they put, um, you know, and again, it's depending upon your, I guess, your wealth. Is initially you dig a really deep hole, mm. and then you basically would put some branches across, maybe some boards, and then you would squat above sort of mm. a hole that mm. would drop into this. As you get more money, you might create a little bit of a shelter. Just As you get more money, you might create sort of a um, concrete um, place above the hole. But some of those. Um, are actually just, you know, maybe 20 feet above where the river is. So the stuff is leaching right down into the stream. Got it. Wow. Okay. I'm good. Are you good, Dixon? Absolutely. All right. 
Let me just uh, read one email before we sign off here. I want to just address it very quickly. This is from Rufus, who writes, I love Twim, Twim, Twiv, and Twip. I contribute annually. Thank you very much, Rufus. But I have to admit, I'm not a fan of all the flying you all seem to do. As far as the podcasts go, I don't think I'd notice if Vincent did the interviews in groups of groups in Australia from Boston or Melbourne. But if we could make academic travel more of an exception than the rule, the world would be better off. And he provides a link to a change.org petition that addresses the issues and a link to some reporting metrics. As to metrics, how about this one? Perhaps for travel to far exotic clinics, your institutions could record the ratio of hours worked in a remote clinic to miles traveled to reach the clinic. Point <laughs> zero two seems a reasonable minimum benchmark. My neighbor did a clinical trip to Tibet last year, and her talk made it seem pretty much a vacation. Two weeks of sightseeing, five days in the clinic, which she highly enjoyed. Mm. I work in industry, have been making similar suggestions about our corporate travel. For example, we shouldn't be able to keep air miles. Companies should use them if they want to reward folks for the hassle and family separation Due to corporate travel, that reward shouldn't be in the form of more travel. Reward should be carbon neutral. <laughs> Best regards, Rufus from Portland. All right. So um, when I I understand this is a an issue, but of course, academic travel is only a fraction of all the travel. I personally do not take vacations when I go to do podcasts somewhere. I go, I do it, and I come back. Um, I I understand that I could probably do them uh, at home by Skype, but I get invited to meetings that people want to see them in person, and I always feel that it's getting more listeners. But um, I think next year will be less flying for me. And um, but are you okay with us taking vacations, Rufus? Just <laughs> pure <laughs> vacations, no work. That would be fine, right? You know, mm. this is a this is a great email. Yeah, I'm very sensitive to this. I was reading, um, sort of nice to see this here. I was reading an article, um, I think actually earlier today in Wired. I don't know if you guys ever mm -hmm. read Wired. Yeah, I love and that. it yeah, was sure. about, you know, how we're, you know, a lot of us are starting to become sensitive, which is ridiculous how long it's taken, but um, there's an increased sensitivity to the environmental impact of what we do. Sure. And it was, you know, they're basically saying like, you know, so you have a, you know, you drive your electric car and maybe you get electricity from your solar roof or wind power and then you jump on an airplane and undo, you know, mm. and um, and that, that sort of rang for me because I have my electric car and I get all my electricity from wind power and I, then I hop on a plane to and from Uganda. Um, but no, I think it's important that we think about that stuff because, uh, you know, the... Uh, when I go to Uganda, I, I talk to my family about I worry about the impact of climate change on the, the people that I take care of. Will they continue to be able to grow these crops? There have been some tremendous um, landslides where a lot of people have died. I, you know, for me, it was an inconvenience, the worst rains in, you know, in a long time in Uganda. But for the local people there, this could mean crop destruction. This could mean people on the edge of, of survival. So, you know, the poorest right. people are the people who are hurt the most by climate change. You got change, creamed so. also. Yeah. So, Rufus, no, this is a good point. I'm glad you bring it up. I will. So, Rufus, would you feel differently if all the airplanes used biodiesel rather than kerosene? Well, it's still putting carbon dioxide out, right? No, no, no. You, it's, it's carbon neutral. It is? Yep. I don't know. No, you, you grow the plants, then you extract the oil, and you burn the oil. The oil goes in the air, CO2. The plants take it back up again, and you can see this as a circle. You're not really contributing any more CO2 to the atmosphere, whereas if you use kerosene, you are. Mm. So the, the claim is, and the Air Force is, by the way, thinking of doing this for practical reasons. You know, fossil fuels are too expensive. Biodiesel is not. So um, they're thinking of converting their entire fleet. <laughs> no, guys, <laughs> go to flightradar24.com right now. Um, okay. Flightradar24.com. Tw flight <laughs> I'm trying. It's you know a, me. I'm Daniel, you can go there, too. It shows uh, an icon for every airplane that's in the air right now. Oh, oh that but would be very disturbing. And, I mean, the U.S. Yeah. is covered with... Oh, it's amazing. Oh, no, no, that I know. I mean, I don't have to see that to know it. My yes, but it's a cool picture. It's a cool picture, Dixon. Yeah, it's well, it's, cool it's amazing when you see the concentration. You look at it Africa. Like, well, it's like <laughs> Africa's <laughs> empty. So India's empty. I guess it's nighttime there. Much of a Soviet 
Oh no, India's not empty. They just had to move it and have it refreshed. But yeah, it, it, again, please. Flightradar twenty four dot com. No, it's amazing actually. And you can the thing that's cool, you can click on an airplane and it will tell you what the flight is. And then you click on the picture of the plane and it will give you the history of the plane, what airline it's been flown for. Yeah, that's no, that's true. Wow. That's so here I just clicked on a flight in the middle of the Indian Ocean, which is going from Hong Kong to Cape Town. Yeah, yeah. It's I a, can do uh, that for your flight. When are you leaving, Vincent? Yeah. <laughs> you could, you could. Yes, it's a very cool thing, but it is amazing. Yeah, there's so many planes and they're burning up, and I'm amazed the earth can take it, frankly. It can't. Well, it's, can't. it's, it's lasted. It cannot take it. it. It's lasted a long, it has a lot of resilience. I agree it will not last, but it's How taking it. How long have we been flying like this? Yeah, a long time, I think, no? No. 20 years? Oh. No, no, no. <laughs> airplane was invented in 1900, so you can... Uh, or I'm talking about, about jet airplanes, right? That was just oh, the jet, 60s. The 60s, yeah. That's not yeah. a long time at all. Yeah. That's, look what we've done in a sh very short time. You know, and I've got the picture here. It's depressing. I, I, I know it's a big problem, but I don't think academic flying is the majority of the issue. I think... Oh, no, it's not. Corporate and political flying, right? Um, Just a flight is so cheap that people of all economic statuses can afford to fly. It's true. I thought it was great when uh, Greta Thornburg sailed across oh, the right, ocean, yeah, yeah. Um, except why I would have paid anything to sail on that boat. What a beautiful boat she came across. On. <laughs> well, I will, yeah, I will make an effort to fly less next year, I promise, because I'm actually not so fond of traveling all that much but so I'll, I'll do i'll do more rufus but i do say that i uh i use the time um very efficiently yeah all right that is twip 178 if you like what we do go over to microbe.tv slash contribute and you can use patreon or paypal to give one dollar two five ten dollars a month and we would appreciate that much not to pay for our air travel. I don't use it for that, actually. Because <laughs> air travel is much more expensive than we bring in here on Microbe TV, just for our expenses. Uh, and uh, if you want to take a guess at the case, twip at microbe.tv. Show notes are at microbe.tv slash twip. Daniel Griffin is at Columbia University Irving Medical Center and parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thank you, Daniel. A uh, pleasure as always. Thank you. Dixon de Pommier, Trichinella.org, TheLivingRiver.org, ParasitesWithoutBorders.com. Thank you, Dixon. Always a pleasure, as someone else in our group used to say. <laughs> I think they still I think they still do. <laughs> I like that saying, though. I, it is a I'm good copying. saying. You can take it. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at Virology.ws. Music on TWIP is by Ronald Jenkins. Thanks, Ronald, and thanks to ASM for their support. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is, is parasitic. parasitic. <laughs> <laughs>